Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did you guys forget so quickly? Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this wonderful event. My name's Linda Applegate, for those of you who don't know me. I'm um, uh, a professor here. I've been here almost 30 years, so it's been a long time, a long time. Um, and lots of changes. Um, I, I'm the department head of the Entrepreneur Management Unit, and uh, also um, the faculty chair of all of our um, uh, programs, our executive programs for business owners and entrepreneurs. And so what we'd like to do today, I have a great panel with me, and I'm going to introduce you in a minute. But I want to just set the stage to briefly, and then I'm going to leave a slide up so you know what we're going to talk about. The name of the panel is uh, Women in Entrepreneurship and the uh, Pursuing Opportunities and uh, Pivoting to Grow. So we're going to talk about early stage and then when you start really growing and what are some of the challenges, et cetera. So I'm sure a lot of you know our definition of entrepreneurship. It comes from Howard Stevenson's work in the 80s. And what it says is that uh, entrepreneurship is the relentless pursuit of opportunity without regard to the resources currently controlled. <laughs> I love that definition. And the reason I love it is it has nothing to do with size of company. It has nothing to do with age of company. It has nothing to do with what industry you're in. What it says is that entrepreneurship is a way of leading. It's a way of leading where you're really looking forward to what are the opportunities, not just how I manage the business today. And then second of all, if you're looking forward and you're trying to think what am I going to do next, the only thing you know with certainty is that the business plan is wrong. Right? All the work the only thing you know with them is that it's wrong. And so you try to find out where wrong and how wrong, right? Early enough. So that you can get that going and get started. So um, uh, that relentless piece of it has a lot to do with this idea that you don't, you never get it right the first time. And then last but not least, you never have all the resources you need. Best entrepreneurs know how to sell, right? That's what's putting a whole entrepreneurial sales force in the first year. It's not reckless really good entrepreneurs, the successful ones, know how to manage risk. Now, you don't, you don't take the risk out. You just understand that risk, but of course, the risk how to manage it. So, if we take that definition and we look at what all the different things are that you have to do when you're getting started, there's a whole set of different uh, things that have to get done. From idea to opportunity, you know, the whole early stage when you're some, uh, exploring, when you're experimenting, you're starting to get going, but you know there's uncertainty, you know there's, you don't have it all right, so you do some experiments to learn as you go. Getting into the market, actually um, uh, getting into the market and starting to pivot to growth and sustainability, evolving it, and then transforming. We put this on a cash flow curve. Because this is the life cycle. Now, many of you will say this is also the hockey stick that these forecasts always look like. But this is the life cycle, right? And so if you put these different things, stages on the life cycle, you start to see that building a business is not just about creativity or innovation and then throw it over the wall to somebody else. You're really going to do it well. You've got to understand you know, the whole path. Now that's what we're going to talk about, specifically the early stage and the growth period, those early growth periods. And we've got a phenomenal panel to talk with you about that. Um, I've got them in a different order than what's on the screen, so you have them raise their hands. First, Marla Malcolm Beck. That's Marla. Marla's the chairman and co-founder of Blue Mercury, and she's also the founder of S61 Labs, okay? And she's going to tell you in a minute her entrepreneurial journey. Janet Kraut. Janet. So Janet is the uh, senior lecturer at HBS now in the Entrepreneurial Management Department. She also is the faculty chair and founder of our Women Founders Forum. Okay, so we now have a whole thing for women founders. And she is the uh, co founder of um, uh, Circle, which is uh, off, and the founder of 
inspired me. And so she's going to tell you a little bit about that before she came uh, to ATS. Uh, Ty Lee, Ty? Ty is the president and CEO of SHI International. Ty and her husband acquired their business. So they're going to talk about they acquired a distressed asset, a software company in the late 80s that was down to one customer. And they got to buy it for payroll. She's now got a company that's worth $5 billion. $5 billion. <laughs> and that's Sheila, Mario Marcella. And that's Sheila. Sheila's the CEO and founder of Care.com. Some of you might have seen her on the ads, and she's going to tell you a little bit about that. She's also the founder of a new organization called Women Up. Org. So, without further ado, I'm going to have Sheila get started because I put them in order of the date they found their business. So we can start with the earliest ones and go on. Poor Ty. She's like, Do I really have to go at the end? She's the so, capster. Sheila. Great to be here. Our, our company, Care.com, is seven years old, and so Linda, thanks for having us. And, and sharing the entrepreneurial journey, I thought I'd just do snippets of some things um, because I know we're going to talk about evolution and everything. Um, how I got here, I, I was a strategy consultant initially, and I decided to join a company actually out of a, a high-tech fellow uh, working for Linda, and I was grading internet business plans. And I didn't feel I was in the too 90s. quality in the 90s. It was a hot time in the internet. I didn't feel I was too qualified to be grading internet business plans, having had no experience in the internet. So I decided to join, and I actually gave up a strategy consulting opportunity and instead joined as a, just a product manager out of business school. I didn't, have, uh, I, didn't ha I didn't have a director title, I didn't have a VP title. But it was a great general management tour of duty. I learned everything around product management, managing technology, uh, creative services, and I think it's critical and important because today, as a CEO, running an internet mobile company, it's not a black box to me. I can engage in those conversations having done the job, and I think as an entrepreneur, when you're resource constraint, sometimes I've got to go fill that job. I play a lot of, of, of different roles in the company when needed. When I have an executive who's going on maternity leave, rather than try and hire somebody, I might run her functional group, and I used to do that a few years ago, not so much anymore, but so it's really important. So I jumped and did that, and then I, I worked for a friend, um, Mark Sinadella, who ran theladders.com, and, and I became a GM before I decided to start my own company. Uh, I then worked at Matrix Partners and an entrepreneur uh, in, res in residence. I didn't even know what that title meant uh, when they offered me the job, but it was nice to when somebody offered to pay me to write a business plan to start a company. So it was a very fortunate um, uh, position that I had, and I wrote the, the business plan for Care.com. What a lot of people don't know is that I actually parked the business plan for months because I wasn't sure that I wanted to do a female-centric business. I didn't want to be judged that after I had done my JD of A at Harvard and I had all these perception issues in my head, I didn't want anyone to think that I was going into the female services business because it was the convenient thing to do versus it was the right business idea to do. Uh, and so I, I went to a couple of mentors and one was a very dear friend of mine actually in section. She was a managing director at an uh, investment bank and she said, after everything that you've done, why would you start a babysitting company? <laughs> And, and it was exactly the feeling that I was going through. And I said, okay, let me ask for other people's advice. And so then I went and I saw a male mentor, and he said to me, are you in the pain or in the pleasure business? Mm -hmm. oh. It was really, really good advice because it made me really question and some soul searching about what, how could I be true to myself? And the reality is that's what I was passionate about. My first job was about saving money for college out of grad school. It's saving, who likes to save money? I like to spend it, you know? I mean, it's just not that fun. Um, the ladders was helping people find jobs. Interviewing, finding jobs, not that fun. How many people like looking for babysitters, nannies, and housekeepers? Now we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make it easier, but it's, it's, not, it's not that fun. And I realize I love working on things and problem solving things that solve a consumer pain. And that's what led me to really go ahead, start the company, and feel confident that this is what I wanted to do. And we'll talk more. I know it's, we only got a, a five minutes. I'd rather just open up Q&A. But so much about what we do is solving this mental perception issues that we've got, right? Uh, and, and the evolution as a leader throughout all of the scaling has really focused on my mental state and framework 
that I have in my head about what I need to be doing at a certain time, rather than worrying about what people think. And so I just wanted to just share that initial story, but there's so many other stories and we'll just let it kind of flow naturally. Thank you. Marla. So I graduated in 1998 and started a business in 1999. And when I was here, the internet was at its birth with going crazy. Amazon was the hot case here, which today, um, I don't know if there's even a case on Amazon anymore. Uh, I had worked at McKinsey, came here, and was always going back to McKinsey, but of course got sucked into private equity. And about six months after I graduated, I was at a janitorial maintenance conference in Kansas City, and I was the only woman there looking at rolling up janitorial maintenance businesses. And I said, something is completely wrong with this picture. Not, not only is this bad, it's actually worse than McKinsey. So, <laughs> I did have a great experience there. Um, and so I actually started scanning for business opportunities. Um, I was you know, sucked in by the internet bubble uh, and decided I was going to bring something new. I, I scanned, I looked at certified email, I had a million completely stupid ideas, including the idea I eventually settled on, which was I was going to be the first to bring luxury cosmetics to the internet. Uh, so I raised a million dollars in two weeks because at that point you could raise money so easily for internet businesses and went to work. And then I needed to do a second round six months later. Well, within that six months, there were five other internet e-commerce companies that had decided that they were also going to bring luxury cosmetics to the internet. And they had raised more money than me. And back then, it was very expensive to develop your own technology. So faced with only a couple of more months of payroll, uh, I had to decide what we were going to do. And not only that, but right after this realization, the internet bubble busted, and the NASDAQ that was at, I mean, um, that was at 5,000 plummeted to 2,500. So there was not a single penny left for internet businesses. And so I decided to go to the board and tell them we were going to buy a, a cosmetics retail store. If you think back to 1999, you could only buy cosmetics at drugstores or department stores at that point. There was no Sephora, no Kiehl's stores, no specialty beauty stores at all. MAC had one store in the United States. I had grown up in California, loved beauty products. Loved, I had facials before anyone knew what that was. And when I was in school here, I used to drive over to Bendel's in Chestnut Hill to get my MAC lipstick. So I definitely knew a lot about beauty. Uh, and so um, there was a little beauty boutique in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., where I happened to live. Uh, and I decided I was going to buy this boutique. They had one or two interesting brands. They had Peels and they had NARS, which were very niche brands at that point. Nobody knew what they were, but I knew because I knew the beauty business. And my board of directors said, we are an e-commerce company. I'd rather go bankrupt than buy a store. And so I said, OK, will you give me permission to buy the store myself? And they did. So I bought the store myself. I had two separate businesses going that had a partnership arrangement. And it turned out that the valuable piece of the business was the store. So a year later, merged um, both the businesses. And we pursued both a retail and e-commerce strategy. And today, uh, we're at 50 locations going to 100. Uh, and we are the fastest growing luxury specialty beauty cosmetics chain uh, in the country. Um, and so many stories about finding my own voice and pursuing a strategy that I thought was right that everybody else thought was wrong. Um, some more about that to come. I will say that in 2006, we recapitalized the company. Um, it's been 14 years, um, and I have an institutional partner, and I still run the company. So interesting story about how you stay with your private equity partners for a long period of time. It's not a typical arrangement. And I have to just do one quick thing. She left out the story of her kids. Each kid was born and has the number of a store uh, attached to it, yeah, so, except for the last one. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I got married at store four, <laughs> uh, had my first child at store five, next child at store eight, and then my son, who was born, we opened 10 stores that year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love There's, that. Yeah. So Janet. Great, thank you. So, so actually it turns out our story, there's some, we, we should have talked earlier. We would have avoided some pitfalls in, the, in, the, in, our, in our storytelling. My, my story begins actually sitting in consulting at 2.30 in the morning, working on some spreadsheet that I'm positive is going to have no impact on anybody, thinking this is not for me. Like this is just not for me. In fact, I'm not even sure what I'm learning here. So I remember sitting at my desk, closing my eyes and saying, okay, so what is for me? When have you really enjoyed anything you, you've done? And the two things that came into my, three things that came into my mind were selling uh, vegetables door to door, selling Girl Scout cookies, and making 
um, braided barrettes and selling them in the neighborhood. And I was like, okay, great. So <laughs> what does that mean I do? And I sort of started telling my parents about this. And at that moment, I was talking to my father. I was like, oh my god, my father's an entrepreneur. That's what I am. Uh-oh. Like, what does that mean? I don't even know. So, it, you know, I'm in, in consulting, and at that moment in time, and I do need to tell the story because it does bring me back to Harvard. At that moment in time, I was like, okay, I need to go to Stanford. <laughs> that's that's where that's where entrepreneurs happen. That's where entrepreneurship happens. So uh, I, I I went to Stanford. That's highly encouraging. <laughs> I'm on a panel. And I... <laughs> of course, that is my nanny. So. <laughs> Um, putting life in work, oh gosh. So, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, I go to Stanford, I meet the woman with whom I want to start a company, uh, and unlike Sheila's story where she clearly had thought about what would make a, big, a very good business, we just decided that we wanted to start something together because we thought we'd make good partners. And um, we drove cross country and talked not at all about what business we would start, but sort of what kind of company we would create and hoped that out of that vision of what kind of co company we would create, it would at least rule out businesses that we wouldn't do. Um, and we went through a lot of ideas and ultimately it came down, we were 27 years old and had no experience other than consulting, uh, which doesn't prepare you for anything, and <laughs> had to pick something that we felt like people would find us credibly able to do. So we decided that without an idea, we would focus on the t almost identical to Sheila, and this is very funny, the time-starved, busy person. And our first business model was uh, think uh, Angie's List or Service Magic, not Care.com because we didn't actually think that, um, that uh, we had the expertise to be able, that people would trust babysitters and nannies online, but they might trust things like plumbers and that kind of thing. $450,000, so we started a company based on that. $450,000 later, we built our first website, because that's what it cost. This is in 1996. Put it online, there's no place to advertise, so we're putting radio ads on, tell, on, on the radio. We hear crickets, chicka, chicka. like nobody shows up, like not a single person shows up to the website. But the phone starts to ring. People have, and we haven't marketed a phone number. So people uh, 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 have, um, found out who we are and have called us because they want what we have, but they don't want it online. There's not, not nobody, and this is the first dot com, like everybody's marketing to teach people that you can do things online. That's why so many hundreds of millions of dollars are spent. So when we get to the story of pivoting to growth, uh, I started a business that was meant to be online serving busy, time-starved women, uh, providing Angie's List services. I ended up being a phone-based service, selling into companies for their time-starved employees, men and women. The largest percentage of who I served at the end when I sold the business were men, getting them into restaurants. So an entirely different business. Than, and the funniest thing to think about this is that when I started the business, I had actually, my business partner and I moved back to New England, to here, because we were both from here and wanted the, we wanted the the support of our families around us. And so I knew once I moved back east that Stanford would be uninterested, which was true. Why would they be interested in an entrepreneur on the east coast? So I knew I had to connect myself with Harvard. So I stalked Bill Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> I found out a conference he was going to be at. I found out what table he was going to be at. I watched him sit down. I sat two seats away so I wouldn't be too stockish. <laughs> Talked to the woman next to me about what I was doing just loud enough so he could hear. He did hear. He said to me, what are you doing? I want to write a case about it. And I said, write a case about it? I haven't done a thing yet. What would you write about? And he was like, I want to write about the journey of discovering an idea and launching a business. I want to write on the eve of your launch. And I said, absolutely not. And he said, why? And I said, because it could be the biggest failure ever. And he said to me that day, that's what women do. They will keep it quiet and sheltered until it's completely fully baked and won't tell a person. And then maybe, possibly, you'll tell your best friend, right? And he's like, you need to stand on the mountaintop and say that Harvard Business School has chosen to write a case about you and you are proclaiming success from day one. And it was like, First of all, the fact that he said women do that, I was like, oh, no, they don't. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> so my, 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 uh, 
my sort of return into this network was through Bill and then uh, through Linda, who obviously ran the, the course Building Business in the uh, Building uh, Women Building Women business. Building Business, where where I, I was a speaker. So. Uh, my return to, the, to HBS here now as, as, as a senior lecturer, my passion and my goal is to help women become, understand this journey and all the pitfalls and all the things you have to do so that we can have a cohort of really successful women entrepreneurs, uh, you know, that's many, many more than there are today. So that's the beginning of Good. my journey. Thank you. Great. Hi. Class of 1985, uh, I have to say, I passed my first cold call and also throughout my entire first year, I don't think I spoke more than 10 minutes. So by the end of this panel, I might speak more than I have my first, <laughs> first year at HBS. I made a decision to become an entrepreneur uh, while I was a freshman at Amherst College. I found myself with very poor English, uh, both written and oral skills uh, at Amherst College, very challenging. And I was, I was determined to be successful and have a successful career and find uh, self-fulfillment that way. And through process of elimination, because most successful career uh, profession required uh, good communication skills, I, I, I decided that the only hope for me to have a successful career was through entrepreneurship, which gave me a lot of time to prepare. So my entire, throughout my entire 20s was spent on learning as much about business as possible reading as much about business and going to HBS was also one of those preparations. But HBS MBA degree provided more than just the preparation. It also gave me insurance that if I failed, that I might be able to land a job <laughs> after the failure. So uh, in similar fashion, you know, I set a goal for myself for every decade. So by end of my second decade, so by 30, I was going to get married so, and also start a, a, a company. Uh, my first company that I started was in furniture manufacturing, where I was a 10% shareholder and the other investors had 90%. And it was a very difficult business and I was working very hard uh, with, with, with tears in my eyes going to sleep and uh, decided that this wasn't going to work out very well. At the same time, my husband, which who is now ex, uh, uh, and I looked for a, a company to actually run more close to where I lived, which was Manhattan. I was, at the time, uh, commuting back and forth to Arkansas and California to run a furniture manufacturing company. So we found Software House, which was, at the time, a failed uh, software reseller in, in the process of closing down business. One company, IBM, and one authorization, which was Lotus 123 back in those days. Uh, Lotus 123 was uh, the most highly um, purchased the application software. I knew nothing about technology, but we we've had an opportunity to purchase this company uh, for, for just a payroll. And also personal guarantee, but since I was not worth anything, I, <laughs> my, <laughs> I, I wasn't hesitant to sign the uh, personal guarantee at all. Uh, so that's how we started, and right after we bought the company, pretty much everybody had been looking for other jobs for years because this was part of a company that had been failing. Um, and pretty much everybody left, so from day one, we became profitable. We didn't know what we were doing, but everybody had left with the exception of one employee. So one customer, one authorization, one employee who actually knew what was doing, what she was doing, and uh, that was our start. Uh, our first year, we managed to actually a book almost a million dollar in sales, eight hundred thousand um, dollars, and for our first ten years, we've been able to double, more than double our business, and uh, reaching almost a billion dollar in business by uh, 1999. Our second date, uh, and that was each achievable because the industry was growing, it's changing. There were a lot of disruptions. We had a lot of opportunity uh, to grow. Our second decade was more challenging. It was um, in the year 2000, between year 2019, uh, 2009. Our addressable market shrank 80%. Uh, we were selling software and uh, soft, software solutions to enterprise customers uh, and hardware solutions as well. And pretty much the Dell effect, which is this intermediation, had taken effect and every large OEMs and publishers were taking their sales direct for at least for the enterprise segments. But amidst, amidst the 
80% decline in market, we found a lot of opportunity and we actually managed to increase our market share from 2% to 20% by the end of our second decade. And also, we were well prepared to expand into other market segments, geography, uh, new solutions. So we've set the ground for additional expansion for our second year. We are in year four of our third decade. Uh, over the last three and a half years of our third decade, you know, we've grown, we've doubled, more than doubled our business from 2.2 billion to 5 billion this year. And actually, as I look out the next six years, I see tremendous opportunity. And what really helps me is, and our, our company is the fact that the industry that we're in is, is, is in the process of going tremendous disruptive uh, transformation that provides a company like us, which is not too small, we have some skill and we have some resources, but not so large like HP, that it's a very difficult boat to steer. A lot of opportunities. Uh, so, you know, as I look back in my 24 year career, I'm, um, you know, I, I think of myself as uh, really in charge of making sure that there is growth opportunity for next, you know, not just next year or this year, but also next decades to come. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so four very interesting stories. Um, remember I said that entrepreneurship is a way of leading. And so as we go, went down the, you know, the row and the, uh, the different um, uh, panelists told their stories, you get a sense for that looking out at opportunities. And all the way um, to Ty Lee talking about the fact that her job is to keep looking for those opportunities and keep that entrepreneurial kind of spirit alive. And it's really um, a testament to all of them that they've been able to do that. Um, I have uh, the hardest thing we do, I, I run this program for business owners and entrepreneurs, and one of the hardest things for them to think through is if I ask them, is this person a good entrepreneurial leader? And then are they are they good uh, are they good operating leader? And many times when people are you know after they built their business and then they're just kind of uh, hanging on to it and not looking for what's coming down the pike, not looking for what's next, and all of a sudden get blindsided. I do a number of cases on that really hard you know time when you built a successful company and you just aren't looking anymore. Um, they will say the person was a good entrepreneur, but there was a good entrepreneur in the beginning of the company, but they're not an entrepreneur anymore. And so that's one of the things I'd really like to focus on as we think about Q&A. What we'll do now is I'll open it up to Q&A and you can ask them about you know, some of these early times, and then we'll get into the pivoting to growth and what it took to really grow this business and how do you keep that entrepreneurial kind of uh, spirit alive and keep thinking about where are we going next as you grow. Uh, so, anybody out there? Questions for our panelists? This is the um, interactive portion of the program. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have one around work-life balance, especially given the survey results and especially since it sounds like children and your lives. I'm curious as to um, sacrifices and whether it was very different than the corporate world and how you navigated those um, nuances. We were actually just talking about it in um, just right before Can everybody this. hear? Um, yeah, I think uh, work-life balance. Uh, you know, and we were just talking about it. We were actually in the same section when we were here in 98. Um, I would say uh, Work-life balance to me is a myth, and we've heard this, and the whole have it all, just throw it out, or throw it out the door. Um, for me, it's been a work-life integration, work-life effectiveness, and we tend to do this a lot. Where uh, I, my kids are just so used. To, I have a 21-year-old and a 13-year-old. I didn't share with my st my story that I, I had him in college, and I've been married 22 years, and it was hard, extremely hard, and just constantly juggling things. And uh, my kids have just grown up knowing the challenges. Um, just the other day, and I, I'll just be really open, I, just two nights ago, I was crying uh, in bed with my son, and I said, I miss you, and I'm having a very difficult week. And he just hugged me, and he said, Mommy, it's okay. 
Yeah. You know, and it and, and it's there's so much of, of of it that it's having your children understand that this isn't easy. Uh, and, and I don't know that that's too dissimilar from corporate life. I think so many people think that entrepreneurship is a cakewalk and it has flexibility because, yes, I am CEO. But the reality is I'm type A and the choices that I make is always putting more on my plate. In fact, Marla's been already mentoring me to say when you hit year seven, you just got to stop, start saying no. And you're not, she, she knows me really well. She's like, and hey, you're not really good at that. So you better start doing that. So I, I think it is about work-life integration and figuring that out. But I, I wish that I had all the answers, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. no, I look Anybody at it, else uh, want to yeah. comment on that? I, I, everyone uh, here you know, has uh, a story to tell, I'm sure. I mean, I think the first two years were crazy. I was 24-7, bell to bell. I didn't have kids at that point. And then once I started having kids, it was, it was crazy. I mean, we were a really teeny company, and I think I work seven days a week up until year six or seven. Um, but I was like Sheila, which is work and family were just all mixed up and jumbled together, and that meant good things and that meant bad things. It still means bad things. Like my daughter last night said, Are you, You're going to be here Friday morning at nine, aren't you? And I looked at her and said, uh, I have a board meeting in New York City. And she said, No, no, we have this event, it's really important. So I quickly called a friend of mine. I'm like, Is it important? She said, Yeah. So I canceled the board meeting. The board understands. And, you know, I'm going on Friday. I, you know, I've been doing it for 14 years, so, you know, it is what it is. But it's, it's messy, and it's, I don't think anyone has the balance. You have to figure out what works for you. Everybody has a different way of working. I'm really good at saying no compared to Sheila. And so I, <laughs> I say no to a lot of things. Um, and so I do what's important to me. But everybody has their way of doing it. No, that's mine. That's right. Any other? <laughs> <laughs> I would give it exactly. That's right. yours. All, all yeah. being mothers, I just texted. Everything okay? Um, I um, so I do. So I started earlier. I, I started right out of business school, and you know, one of the benefits. Of the, so it's pros and cons too, right? One of the benefits of that is that you don't have a lot of those things. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have family. You don't have kids. You, maybe maybe you're married. Maybe you're not. My partner was married at the time. I wasn't. Um, and so the good news there was that I was able to be really, really focused on something I was passionate about and not feeling that I was making those trade-offs. The bad news was I forgot to get married, almost. <laughs> I like woke up at 38 and went, oh my gosh, wow, hello, it's 38, aha, uh -huh, that like just flew. And so I had a, you know, I, I focused on that as hard as I focused on business. And <laughs> And I had twins at 41, and so uh, just slid right under that door. But I do, I, 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 counsel, I counsel women to be very thoughtful about that because this is, I mean, even though it, it worked out for me, I was very lucky. That's not the, you know, that's not necessarily the formula for success. But there is something I do say to women that trying entrepreneurship young is a great thing because how far can you fall, really? I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to get the job you would have gotten when you graduated from business school anyway, and now you'd have some really great skills that you, you, know, that you would have learned somewhere else. Um, then I, but then I did have kids. What's, uh, and then <laughs> to prove that you do lose your mind when you have children, <laughs> I sold my company on October 31st, uh, 2007, and started a new company November 1st, 2007. Um, when my twins were uh, 18 months old. And I was completely hallucinogenic because they, they, they were babies, and that was actually decently easy. It was when they turned out to be three and four that it got, that it got much harder. And in fact, even though now I'm in a teaching role, I, I still tend to overextend because I think that's what we all do anyway. So whatever the job is, we overextend. My daughter said to me last night, Mommy, it's so sad when you leave at five and come home at seven because I do, five in the morning because I don't because I don't see you and my friends' moms don't work and I was like you're six oh. this is just the beginning <laughs> right this is just the beginning um, and of course there are lots of her friends' moms that do work but um, so it's not easy but I don't think I don't think I honestly don't think there's any path the, the only thing I do say is that I do I. In that role, I did when I went ahead, kids, and I was a CEO. I did have the control. The meeting agenda was set by me, so I could decide when those happened. And if I did need to pull the trigger on the board meeting, I could. Although I didn't just answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> right? I didn't. I didn't, and I'm worried because I have an asthmatic daughter. <laughs> I waited 10 years before I had my child. I knew the time clock, so I had my first child at 39. Mm -hmm. And after my divorce, I actually had a second child, uh, unwed mud mother, uh, 
through an IVF technology. Um, so the, the good thing about starting family late, at least in time, uh, is that you can afford a lot of uh, help. Uh, I, I also use care.com from time to time. <laughs> but um, it, it is a juggle, and you have to prioritize and uh, know what's important to you. I, what helps me is that I look at my entire life map in 100 year chunks. So I could, you know, while I might not be able to have everything um, in parallel, I can have most things in serially. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I try to view the options and choices and trade offs we have. And I have to admit, entrepreneurship is a very good way to be able to, you know, set your own pace. Because I think that's probably the most important thing, you know, is it's not balance, it's integration. Uh, I used to, when I had my son at 42, you know, I'd been teaching everybody about balance for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had my son, and um, during his first year of life, he went on 11 business trips with oh, me. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, I just kept taking him with I, and Somewhere around year two, I realized he really didn't want my schedule, you know? And it was just a big shock. And so that's when I actually realized that, you know, you take on different roles as you go through life. And uh, the getting married role, going to work role, all these other roles, somehow seem to be able to kind of be put, just put it on and, you know, carry it with you. Um, the kid role was the one where I had to stop and say, it just didn't just kind of get globbed on. So that's where I had to stop and just like all of them, say, what do I really want out of life and make some choices and who's me? And by the way, it's a very selfish decision. That's one thing we don't do well, is that you're really going to make the best decision if you really say, what's important to me? Then after that, you'll say, you know, what's important to me, but then, you know, then you, you know, kind of open up to all the other people that I have to, you know, that I, are in my world and that I want to satisfy. But in the beginning, because there's all kinds of ways it'll work. There's all kinds of ways it'll work. So in the end, it's really what's the most important to you. And then, how do I bring the rest of the people in the world along with me? You know, and, and that helps you to prioritize. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about what is the message that we should be giving to our kids. Okay. Um, my daughter, when she was little, wanted to be a doctor, 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 doctor. All of a sudden, she now wants to be a nurse practitioner. She doesn't want to take off the medical school. She can have flexibility around the family. And it, it, it's sad. It's, she came to it on her own. Yeah. But what is the right thing? Because huh. we're at the point where the kids are making choices, and how do we help them learn what we let me, let me put that one just for just a minute, okay? But I want to keep it. Don't let me forget. At my age, I forget. But I want to find out, are there any questions about that early stage? And especially, you did talk about the fact starting families and trying to get families and careers, and they're saying, get into it. Get started. It's a good, you know, you can do it. Any questions? Yes? So some of us are on this highway, and we have a career on the path, and then at some point we go, gosh, should I take a detour and do something different for myself, for a business, whatever it might be? That's my question for you guys is, if you decide, yep, hallelujah, that's what I'm going to do, what are the first decisions, critical decisions that you have to make? And think about which time you guys make those decisions, whether it's choosing a partner or a business. So the, 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 the question is, you know, you're kind of going along, and all of a sudden you make the decision, and how do you sequence the decisions when you decide? You want to be an entrepreneur? Right. Yeah. And what are the you, you, you know, what's the sequence that you go through in your mind? Do you, people remember that? So for me, it was dual, which is, oh my God, I have student loans. I got to pay them. And can I raise enough money for an idea so I can be in business for at least a year or two to see if it works? So it was the idea and just having enough money to get by because everybody has expenses. And so you need to be able to at least, I would say to, to people that call me now, at least raise enough money to, so that you can pay your own expenses for a year or two while you figure out what works because the business you go into isn't right. It's going to be the one you end up with. So it's really, it's the idea and raising money and how you combine those together on the right track to start. 
And so for me, the, it was as simple as that. Now, I didn't, I didn't have a family. I was also very young, but I had expenses. And so it's, it's those two things. I was scanning for ideas while I was figuring out who I was going to go to to raise money. And it, it was marrying those two together. And so Marla, again, she graduated at the time when the internet was really red hot. So time, what, what did you think about when you, the first things that you thought about? You said that you decided you wanted to be an entrepreneur really early. And it wasn't something a lot of people were doing in the 80s. That's right, because I didn't feel that I had an option. If I wanted a successful career, I didn't feel that I could be a successful lawyer or a corporate, working in a corporate. I definitely couldn't be a consultant, management consultant, uh, because of my English. You know, nor investment banker. So really, I think having, feeling as though you have no choice just uh, <laughs> sometimes helps you. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Is that, but that says that we're finding this to be true. And one of the things we'll talk about by the end is that women entrepreneurs often choose entrepreneurship because they don't want to do the other thing. You know, and it's, uh, it's a choice of not doing, not going on this familiar path where everybody else is going. I want to be able to do something else, and I want to be able to make a big splash. And I, I want to do it for myself. So that's, a, that's a very interesting, and we're finding a lot of that. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, for me it was sort of uh, three things. It was life. Um, I wanted to actually start a company right after you promised and a mentor sat me down and we had just had a death in the family. Uh, my husband's brother had passed away and he actually said, it's not a good time. Like to start a company, there's a lot going on. Both my husband and I went to business school in the same year so we did have loans as well. There's just a lot going on but I was so passionate about wanting to do it. Um, and so I had to actually postpone uh, some time, and that's when I decided to join the ladders and continue sort of honing my skills on the entrepreneurship skills while I waited to, to start my own company. Um, and then for CARE specifically, it was the team. I wanted to make sure that there was a, a, a team that was ready to join me on this, on this mission. Uh, and, and on this adventure. And so it was, and I have co-founders and they're amazing and we still work together today um, after seven years and I've known many of them for over 15 years. And so it was just lining that up and making sure that that was ready and I felt good about that. And then the third is that the total addressable market and the vision was absolutely fundable, not just from the A round, but I knew that I could scale this all the way through. We've raised $111, $111 million to date. <coughs> We're in 15 countries, right? I mean, we, we, I wanted to know that this was a huge commitment of my time, the team's time, and this was not going to be a flip idea because I wanted to put so much of my energy in it. So those were my three criteria, making sure that it was worth my time and energy because I knew it was going to be such a huge commitment. Now, I want to come back to the, the question now. Um, would you tell your daughter if you had one? I know Sheila's just got sons. You know, the rest of them have daughters. Um, would you tell your daughter if you had one now that entrepreneurship was a good, good road for women? I don't, I don't have a daughter. Like because I want one so badly. <laughs> I can tell my daughter. I, I, keep, I keep thinking I'm still 42, and maybe there's still time. My husband said I don't think so. Um, <laughs> life's too busy. But in fact, we womenup.org we are launching uh, uh, seventh and eighth grade girl camps um, uh, to teach them entrepreneurial competencies to address the specific issue that Ty also mentioned that you that you also succinctly summarize for people the issue that sometimes is. As women, we decide to pursue entrepreneurship because the other option isn't great. And my hope is that for seventh and eighth grade girls, and we're and having looked at some sort of scientific studies around how the, the brain develops and social skills develop, um, I really believe that if they start early, looking around and thinking about how do they solve problems in general, that then entrepreneurship becomes an actual career path that is open and is it a choice is a choice for them rather than an option because the other options aren't great, right? That it's a positive opportunity and also my personal passion around that is that it's solving non-gender specific issues. It is, it is solving problems wherever they see it. And again, since what I, you know, what, we're, I'm working with a lot of uh, schools 
you know, kindergarten, uh, you know, the elementary school, right now to start putting entrepreneurship in the curriculum at the real young ages because entrepreneurship is not a, it's not a thing. It's not that I build businesses, et cetera, et cetera. It's a way of leading. And if it's really a way of leading, it's a way of leading that allows us to really go out and seek opportunity and understand how to make it happen. Everybody needs that. Everybody needs that. So that's the, yeah. Um, yes? Yeah, I'd like to ask, you talked about your business is really changing so much. And so can you talk about your choice of partners? And also maybe you have any experience working virtually? Because Are you talking about business partners? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I think virtual work is something that does happen now. So if you have experience uh, with virtual teams and have that work, but also with your business partners, what if you really were committed to one idea first or you had one on the technology first, and if that doesn't turn out to be the thing that you're doing, you're going to a store instead of the technology, how did that relationship evolve? And so, so I started with a partner first and no business idea. So I, uh, um, and um, we, we from the very, very early on, we defined sort of a commitment about what kind of an impact, what kind of a size, what kind of a scale, what kind of a space we wanted to play in, <clears throat> broadly enough so that we knew that we could iterate within it and that we didn't have to get tied to any, we wouldn't, we weren't putting our stake on the right idea first. We knew enough to know that these things changed. So we kind of set that as our parameter. Plus, we didn't have an idea, so that helped <laughs> to give ourselves that kind of space. But we, very interestingly, we spent a lot of time talking about how we would make decisions, what kind of partnership we would have. We were very clear from the beginning that we wanted to be 50-50 partners as long as we possibly could. We tried on co-CEO for a while, and basically the whole venture community nixed that. Thankfully, that's... Um, I can, I can name a whole bunch of co-CEOs who are women today that weren't when, when I did it. Um, we worked hard on our decision-making process, and we respected it. We were very, we thought we were, we thought we were very, very similar when we first met, but we came to realize we were actually quite different. I was very much, if there's a problem, if in doubt, call out, and her methodology would be, if you don't know what to do, build a spreadsheet, which was great. Like, we just had totally different approaches. And our decision-making process, because we respected each other, knew we brought different strengths, was we would debate the issue or the question or the business on its merits until we agreed we disagreed. Then we would ask each other, who cared more? Because sometimes you just care more for some reason. Who cares more? And if we couldn't decide based on who cares more, we would agree we'd flip a coin. <laughs> and in 10 years, we flipped a coin once over the question of where our shared assistant sat. <laughs> outside her office or outside my office. <laughs> Flip the coin, she won. Outside her uh, office, which is at the other end of the, the office, because at the time that we founded the company, people thought we were so similar that we wanted to make sure that they couldn't just go to Kathy for an answer, and if Kathy wasn't there, go to me, because I didn't answer her questions and she didn't answer mine. But this was like five years in, and so people were really clear. So she won the coin toss. I went high, I said, you won, outside your office, that's right. Come in the next morning, I'm like, I have an idea. What if we moved the CFO's office to your office and moved you next to me? Then our shared assistant could sit outside of our office. So even the coin flip got changed to, <laughs> to mutual agreement. But that decision-making process was, the, just the thought behind it was really important. I know the last story was a little flippant, but that, but, but that is how we thought about partnership. That's time. And, and uh, you and Marla both started your companies with your husbands to be, or yeah, ex, <laughs> or ex husbands. Yeah. So, so from day one, um, I was initially 51% shareholder and a chairman of the board because I was already running a furniture company, and he, my husband. X <laughs> was the CEO, but very quickly we flipped the role because actually it turns out that I enjoy running the company day to day, and he actually did not. And over time, I've been able to buy his shares out, and he's actually the best partner for me to have. We still have a very good relationship, and he still has a special share in the company. And we were lucky, and I, I want to tell you to young entrepreneurs here in that we were turned down for our first loan and we never thought to seek 
private equity or venture capital par uh, investor because we, we've, we were forced to grow organically, which provided a certain kind of discipline for the organization. And also, now we realize that we can reap the benefits of having the majority shareholder. I mean, actually, 100% sure. Uh, uh, we, so, you know, if you have a bright, promising idea, don't, don't be so eager to go and raise money and give all your shares away in venture A, B, C, and D rounds. Because, I, you know, when you're very successful, you'll have made your investors far more successful than yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I'd actually rather touch on that than um, the, the partner issue because I really believe in that. When I was at Harvard Business School, the whole message was get big fast, get big fast, grow a business that, get, that gets big fast. And we ended up not being able to. There was no money to do that. And so we had to build a business that was, grew for profit. And the outcome of that was that I had control and so I would say, you know, forget GBF. I'm into grow for profit and control because ultimately we built a business model that has survived 14 years and continues to grow and change. Um, we had control, so we made really good decisions and we made decisions for revenue and profit. And so it was a completely different model um, than what everybody was talking about at the time, but by necessity we had to do that. And it turned out to be sort of um, a relief because we were in control, but also incredibly lucrative because when we went in 2006, we had um, you know, the, the far majority of the business. And so it's a different business model. I think it works more for niche strategies also. I mean, there are certain cases where you, like Sheila's, where you may have to take the entire market or see if you see something to a competitor, it diminishes your business model. But for us, this growing for profit and control, which came out of necessity, and you know, really goes to your point, um, made a big difference for us. I'd like to have Sheila just uh, add in. Uh, she's grown her business through a lot of acquisitions more recently, so but I'd like her to give you that growth story, how she's pivoted to growth, and then we'll open up to questions again. Sure. So, you know, we, we actually raised, as I mentioned, a lot of money. So uh, a really different experience because at, at the time, um, you know, we had raised our, our A and B round and then 2008 hit. Uh, and uh, we decided we had seven million in cash and that we would just preserve cash and the company was close to profitability. And I had Thai strategy, which was, you know what, we're not going to raise anymore. We're doing fine. And then I had a venture capitalist come in and fly in proactively and said, it is just unconscionable <laughs> that you are not growing this business faster. He spoke to me on the mission that so many other families can have access to it. What he really wanted was more equity in the company. <laughs> but he spoke to me on the mission. Um, but I, I then found myself, we were so close to profitability, deciding that, you know what, he's right though. We, did, we really debated it as a board, and what was so funny about the story about vision and where I wanted to go and pivot the company, year two, so this was actually a, a year before uh, the recession, a year two, I went to the board and I presented to them this grand vision of where I wanted to take the company. And they all looked at me, and this is what we, you know, we had just raised like $15 million, and they all looked at me and said, that's crazy. It's just too big. It's too. It's too massive. And we've got this to focus on. And as and you know, all the books on focus. And you got to focus. You got to focus. Uh, and given our size, and I soon realized that I needed to work on influence, and I needed to pace and be patient about how I actually communicate vision in an effective way, right? And I decided to to really put that aside. And so when I learned as each round came along. I would only show them phases of the company that I felt comfortable letting them know that we were building and they had no idea that we were doing all these other things. <laughs> and then when they had decided to invest, because we were only showing historical and forecasted things on things that were monetized and ready and profitable, they invested on that, they were shocked to find out as they peeled the onion and looked under the covers that there were all these other things. Right? And so the way that I thought about it, and a good friend of mine, Allison Manukin, also graduated our year. I didn't do it. She's brilliant. The other day I was having breakfast with her and I was describing my business. She said, you know, at Intuit, we call that Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3. Yeah, exactly. And then I said, wow, I, and, and I was intuitively doing this for the company. I had a bunch of businesses that all were already scalable and profitable, so Horizon 1. 
We now also had LTV CAC microeconomics proven out, Horizon 2 businesses, and those I would still show investors if I were, if I were raising money again. And then I had a bunch of Horizon 3 companies that we were operationalizing. But people were shocked because our size, why would you do that? But the reality is if you're preparing to go public, you have to think about the next two years post-IPO and the products that you have to release and how long it takes to build those things, not just the Horizon 1 businesses that you prove at profitability at IPO, and then what? What story are you going to tell the market at that point? It really is about evolving and thinking about those things, no matter what stage you're at, to really prepare for the future. So a lot of pivoting and growing is really about thinking what I liked, Allison called those three horizons. So one of the things that you're seeing is building businesses is not just doing this and stopping. Building businesses is a whole series of these life cycles that are actually leveraging off and building on the ideas you've already done. And this horizon one, two, and three is critical. No one executes a vision no one executes a strategy. You execute projects and initiatives, but if you don't know where you're going, not any path will do, you know? So you've got things that are close in that you're working on right now. You've got things that are a little further out, your horizon two, that are things that you've got, um, uh, that are kind of giving you a sense of direction. Then you got Horizon 3, which uh, are all those big opportunities, all the things that I could go after later on. Yes? Um, yeah, so along those lines, I, you know, you, you're talking about Horizons. I think I have a new business with a partner, and we call it kind of multilateral thinking. How are we going to pay the bills this month? What are our goals over the next 12 to 24 months? And then what are our longer term goals? And we find that it's a constant exercise to be flexing between thinking about all those things pretty much simultaneously all the time. But the question I would like to ask is, who um, have you guys brought in to help you with that thinking? And it's really my question is about board composition. And how have you chosen people to complement you, that people that will you know, respectfully disagree with you will challenge you? you know, what, what have you each done about that? So board. So there's only two members of the board. I have, I have the most sort of say so. There is no board, but what I have found <laughs> to be interesting is that I go to talk to our largest customers, so Fortune 50 companies. They have, they talk to the Accentures and the PwCs and the McKinsey's and Banks all day, and they bring ideas that are, that would help their companies, but they cannot execute on. So I use, we use, our largest companies as uh, a lab of sorts. And what you have to do is actually pick and choose the most feasible ideas that, that can then be scaled uh, operationally as well as uh, to other market segments. But I, I that, that's what we do. We're a knowledge company, so maybe that, yeah. Does anybody not have, have the board that you fashioned on your own? That you know, where it's a it, you, you didn't have investors on it, you had you actually fashioned it. I I think we probably yeah. all had investors. So so I had um, investors because I did take venture funding, um, and they just come with the term sheet, right? And you hopefully get the ones you have picked your term sheet and your investors so that you're okay having on the on your board. And I do think of them as partners. I mean, you're married to them. But then I was always very, uh, and I give this advice all the time, which is you need to find for your board CEOs who have scaled like kinds of businesses and who have gone through the same life cycle as you have but are five or seven years ahead of you or three to five years ahead of you. Um, in, in my board, I actually had a, a relatively large board. I had three outsiders of that kind. So I always have the outsiders equal the investors. Because um, the because the because the investors have a stake in this, but they don't necessarily have operating experience. So, um, and I would also over the ten years that I ran my first company, sometimes I would just like with some employees, you would outgrow them. So I would outgrow and I would change up those outsiders based on where our company was, and they were always a good source of how to think about the ne next phase of growth, and in particular how I needed to grow from a founder to a junior CEO to a medium-sized CEO to a bigger CEO never got to the point that um, I sold our company when it was about 70 million in revenue so at about a thousand employees so um, uh, you know never never took it beyond that 
So let me, uh, we're out of time now, so, but I do want them to give you one, you know, some advice that they, if they were to give advice to women who want to be entrepreneurs, to women entrepreneurs, what advice would you give? Let's start with Ty and then we'll go this way this time. Okay, so my, my advice would be uh, to make sure you think long term, you prioritize what you, uh, what is important to you, and and that um, that 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 you try <coughs> not to think traditionally. So, for example, I mean, while it's fantastic to have marriage and children together, but not necessarily. I mean, there are only very few uh, limitations that, uh, as far as I'm. So, so, try to think outside the box and try to solve problems for yourself because you know what is important to me is different for. You know, each of us is different. Yeah, I would say, um, so women tend to be relatively very, very good planners, very good with capital, very capital efficient, and that's wonderful. That makes us great operators. I, I encourage women, my advice is always, if you want to think big, do. Do not be held back by some fear that it can't be as big as you could imagine it to be just stake your claim and own it and grow into it. Um, I, I, I think we sometimes underestimate and sort of my original story and therefore don't, don't stake the claim as widely as we could and just go, go out and go full for it. Uh, I would say it's never ever a good time to start a business in your life, <laughs> ever. You know, you're either young and you have student loans, you're having kids, you have sick parents, it's never a good time. So at some point you have to make the decision if you want to, to say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and then go full force, but it will never ever be a good time. So just decide and go for it. And you always said to find your voice. Yes. This is a really... Uh, I, th I think for me, I was always a little bit of a rebel. I always went against our board. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but I always really made the best decisions when I took some time out and really thought about what the right thing was to do and stop listening to everybody else. So it started with the first um, s decision to go into the store business, and that has continued really thinking about what is the right thing for the business and the company for success and not listening too much to other people. Sheila. Yes, and for me it's sort of related to the brand building. So starting with your own authentic passion of what you're deciding to do is really going to build that brand. But so much more importantly is, and we learned this in business school, uh, around spreadsheets and prod profitability and revenue growth and those things that drive. The reality is people build companies. People deliver as, as services. It is about our teams and our employees that build brands because they're the ones who make exceptional products. So whatever you do as an entrepreneur, you're not doing it alone. Your team is your number one resource. So whatever it is, get the right team from the get-go and you will build the right values and brand for your company. Thank you very much.